Hello guys, welcome back to Random Access Projects. Today we're going to talk about steer by wire and this is one of those concepts that originally was kind of complex in my mind and I was always wondering how they do that and I tried building some models uh, to understand this better but it wasn't until I started experimenting with brushless motors that I really understood that it is not that complex at least in principle. I have put together a demonstration and I have simplified it as much as possible so it's easy to understand. So let's get started, let's play. So we're gonna go back in time to 2010 to 2013 where I was lead engineer in uh, the development of Mexico's first commercial super sports car, the Vulo 5. Now the principle for steering can be very easy. However, when implementing it, factors like packaging and other practicalities can affect the route of the mechanical components, creating some weird angles and uh, these weird angles actually lead to some non-linearities in the behavior of the system, uh, in the torque. In order to guarantee a proper handling and proper performance, one must take these uh, factors into account. And there is so many principles and information and things to consider while designing a steering, but I kept thinking, how cool would it be if we could get rid of that mechanical connection between the steering wheel and the steering rack. That would allow us for easier packaging. It would allow us for different ways of programming the steering behavior. It would increase the safety during collisions and many other benefits. At the end, of course, we stuck to a high precision steering rack and that gave us the performance and the handling we needed. But I always kept thinking, how could I solve this problem by applying mechatronics? How could I make a steer by wire system in which you can have forces going both ways from the steering wheel into the steering rack and vice versa? After many years of thinking about this, I was able to make a working prototype, which I'm showing to you today. Now this working prototype is just in principle. It has yet to be implemented in a working model. But what you can see here is the two motors that represent the steering wheel and the steering rack. So these are the actuators and sensors that would be installed in both ends of the steering system. So I have the two motors connected to the ports and then I have the encoders connected into the port encoders of the, of the new version of the board. So I have a larger motor here and if I rotate it, you can see I'm driving it with, with my hand and you can see how it is mimicked by the smaller motor here. And then the interesting part comes here. When I rotate the smaller one, then the larger one rotates. So there is a cross communication be between the two of these. Now, watch this, I'm moving this one. And if I stop this one, you will see that there is force being communicated. There is torque that is being transferred, so to say from one motor to the other one. And it also happens the other way around. If I, of course, this motor, the smaller one has less uh, capability for producing torque, but you can see, you can see how the cables down here move. When it comes to the code, it's pretty much something we have discussed in previous videos. So it's a closed loop uh, motor control, but we have two of everything. Instead of having just one encoder, now we have two encoders, A and B. So that's for motor A and that's for motor B. So we have the motor A in ports uh, 3, 5 and 6, uh, the coils for motor A. And then we also have the coils for motor B on ports 9, 10 and 11. So I named the coils like this, AA, AB, AC, and then we have BA, BC, uh, BB, and BC. And then 
we can specify the particular numbers of poles for each motor. So in this case, the smaller motor only has nine poles, while the biggest motor has 11 poles. So we don't need to use two lookup tables for the um, sinusoidal wave because we're going to use two indexes or more to read them. So it's the same lookup table, just read with different indexes. And then we have the indexes for motor A, indexes for motor B, and then the calculations for the shaft also always, uh, well, we're initializing our variables. And then we have position A, that's the position of the rotor for motor A. Position B, it's uh, the same, but for motor B. Electrical positions that we have discussed in uh, other videos in the channel. Uh, you can refer to those if you don't know what this is for. Torque. And um, important, we have the set point, we have direction for both motors and um, the error, right? Because we're gonna have a, a proportional control loop. Then it's pretty much the same code for uh, determining the electrical position and then doing all the scaling and that is repeated for both. We um, process the input for the encoder and do all the scaling necessary. Important notice here how these values are different and that is because the encoder is giving me different values for each motor. This is a very critical step that you need to make sure that the range that is being given to you by the uh, encoder in your motors is reflected here. Uh, that's going to give you more precision and less vibrations. And then we get to the important part where the magic happens. We take the position of both motors and then we get the mean out of it, the average. And that is what we're now calling the set point. So to calculate the error, we're gonna take the position for each motor minus the set point. And that's how we calculate the error. That is done for both. So you can see that the error for motor B is calculated using position B minus the same set point that we calculated and that is constructed by the average of those two positions. And that's pretty much it. The rest is your normal proportional control, determining if the error is positive or negative, determining the direction of the rotation, and then here we determine the amount of torque or the length of the field vector, and then we just apply it. And then, of course, we need to determine the offset for each motor that is also particular to each of your motors. So remember to have this in place. And that is pretty much it. I want to also mention that thanks to some of your comments in previous videos, I was able to find another way of making this work. And it's even simpler than the one that I had developed myself. So in this one, we don't calculate the set point based on the average of the positions, but we just jump into using the position of the other motor as the set point. So if you remember position A, and we would subtract the set point, but in this case, we're subtracting the position B. While calculating error B, we do the opposite. To position B, we take its current position and we remove it. Uh, the position of the older motor. So we get the error calculated as this. So if there is a discrepancy between the two positions, then we have an error. And that error is going to be present on both motors. It's just that they're going to act in opposing ways. So then one motor will try to go to the position where the other motor is, while the other one is doing the exact opposite. To try and make it simpler for you to understand, I made this diagram in which you can see both proportional controls fitting the motors and you can see also uh, the typical configuration for a closed loop control system. Now watch closely as I add the feedback loops. I hope this diagram makes it easier to understand what's going on in this code. That's going to be it for today, guys. Uh, thank you so much for all the support. 
Uh, check back soon. I'm going to be posting more videos as time allows. Stay safe. See you soon.